All right, Richard. So I thank you for coming on the podcast. I also thank you for having me on your show um, on iHeartRadio. And is it, it WOR or 710, right? That was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah that was um, a lot of fun. You were great. And thank your wife too for having me on her fireside chat thing uh, oh, she for says, attorneys. She says the best things about you, Mitch. Yeah, she's a real marketing machine, huh? Yeah, she sure is. She's doing a lot she of stuff. I was just talking to somebody, my friend Fred, who runs my Wednesday morning group, and he had met her at some Morristown tech startup group or something, I guess that she's involved yeah, with. There used to be a Morristown meetup and that used to be before COVID when you could actually go out and meet people. That was one of the local tech groups. And uh, we participated there for a, a long, long time. Right. And, uh, but now everything has changed. So. Yeah. There's going to be the term BCV right before coronavirus is going to be <laughs> marking things in history. That's what's going to happen. But um, yeah. all right. So what I maybe we could you could tell me a little bit about you know your background and uh, you know where you've worked and how you got into law because then I want to get into all the intellectual stuff that most small business owners would be dealing. With. Okay, great. Well, I'll keep it as short and uh, well, succinct. We got an as hour, possible. so don't rush too yeah, much. Yeah. So um, well, I, I started my career as uh, a chemist. I, I worked for the BF Goodrich Company. Okay. And uh, after working there, I decided to go to law school. That's the company that had those funny commercials, the Goodrich blimp. And then the guy goes, Goodrich doesn't have a blimp, right? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a good memory. Right. Okay. And so anyway, I ended up going to law school. I was only sort of half into the idea, but it was sort of a recession and, and you know, people were getting laid off. I was in Cleveland, of Ohio, of all places. Okay. So you're and like, let's go back so, to school, right? Well, yeah. So why not go back to school? Right. And I always loved Perry Mason. That was he was my inspiration. I thought if I went to law school, I'd be cross It's all like that, right? That's what people think. Yeah. Yeah. And and of course it doesn't ever work that way. If you're watching that show file, Suits right now, you know, Suits with Meghan Markle with my wife. She's oh like, yeah, I've seen that. Like this. I go, of course it's not. There's nothing like law. <laughs> law would be boring if you did really what you did at a law firm in a TV show. Nobody would watch. I know. You just like remember <laughs> take your kid to work day. I bring my kid to work and I say, well, these are the file cabinets. We put all the documents in. Right. Go sit in the kitchen and the, uh, color. Printer. <laughs> yeah. My daughter said, "Can you take me to work?" She's a teenager. I go, "What are you going to do? There's nothing to do. You're going to sit here and watch me the whole day?" It's not, you know, it's not like we're having like a big company, right, where they do a picnic out on the lawn for all the kids and they got clowns and make it a big right. day of it. We don't do that. We're small business owners. So yeah. it's funny. So, okay. Anyway, so right, but that's not what I had in my head. And uh, I never, I never knew uh, any attorneys. Uh, well, okay. I, I knew one attorney. Okay. Um, and, uh, but I didn't really know what it was like. And so, but it just seemed like a logical step for me. Right. And so I ended up going to uh, Case Western Reserve uh, Law School. Sure. Um, and uh, after that, I went to Switzerland. Is Case um, Western in Cleveland? It's in Cleveland, Ohio. Oh, okay. It is. And uh, it's where the presidential debates were. Right. Uh, last, For some the, reason, last I thought that was like in Colorado yeah. was where Case Western was, but I guess I'm wrong. Yeah, no, it's in Cleveland. Yeah. And so uh, after that, I, I went to Switzerland. I, I studied at the Graduate Institute of International Studies, and they have sort of a master's degree in international law. Okay. And it's right sort of in the center of all of the UN, uh, you know, complex there. And so I thought, well, maybe I'll go work for the UN or I'll do something. Uh, I ended up taking a job at Jones Day, which is this big multinational law firm. They had an office in Switzerland. Okay. And I did corporate deals and um, uh, international arbitration. And wow. international so you're working arbitration on big stuff. Is, you know, where co companies from different countries right. fight it out over Yeah, so you're stuff. working on big stuff. Yeah, they were big, big cases. One yeah. of the cases was between Alcon and they had, this was back in 1990. Uh, they had, Alcon, a French telecom company, had sold uh, the Chinese a bunch of switching equipment for telephones. And they, okay. they, the guy who sold it got into a dispute with the telecom company because he wanted his commission, which was like 2%, but the sales were like you know, $10 billion. Right. Yeah, 2% was a equipment. lot of money. So, and 2% <laughs> was like pretty important to him. Yeah. And, the year's uh, salary probably. Right. So, <laughs> so, so anyway, I did that for a while and then um, finished up my degree, came back, 
came to Chicago, worked for a boutique IP law firm, and then eventually went on the corporate side. I worked for Dow Corning Corporation, which is now part of Dow, but that was mm -hmm. a joint venture between Dow Corning and Corning Glass. Right. And I learned a lot about industrial kind of chemistry. Uh, I was there for seven years. I became a manager. I left because they were in bankruptcy over the silicone breast implant controversy. Oh. And I just did not see that as being a good place to be. And so we ended up in Atlanta at a company called Seba Vision that made contact lenses. Okay. I was part of uh, Novartis, a subsidiary of Novartis. And I was there for, uh, I don't know, five, six years. And then eventually ended up uh, heading up the intellectual property group for Novartis Pharmaceuticals here oh, in New Jersey. So that's how you started getting into intellectual property. So all of that, it was intellectual property. That whole time was just, uh, when I went to the boutique firm in Chicago, that was intellectual property. And I knew after like doing it for two weeks that this was my calling, this was my profession that I was gonna be doing it the rest of my life. I just really liked it. I liked the technology. I liked the documents. I liked right. the fact that there's international pieces to interle uh, international, uh, intellectual property. There's international patents. There's agreement work. There's litigation. You can work for the government. You could right. work for Plus you had a technical degree, right? Don't you need a technical degree to, to join the patent bar? I couldn't do it. I was yeah, an economics yeah. major, right? Oh, uh, well, mm, that it's, might be. They're more liberal nowadays. Courses, it's not too late. Okay. Uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll let you uh, do it. That's okay. You'll, 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 stay where, you'll stay with what you know. <laughs> right. Um, no, it, yeah, I have a chemistry degree. So my, my specialty uh, is really life sciences. So uh, medical devices, uh, pharmaceutical products. Right. But the firm as a whole uh, works in all technology areas. We work in software. We work in... Uh, consumer products. We work with inventors. Uh, we we have a couple of larger companies as, as clients in the you know Fortune 500. So we really do soup to nuts. We work with anyone. Our hearts are really with the entrepreneurs. Uh, when I left Novartis, I was kind of just tired of the corporate attitude, and I wanted to do something different and better. And so. Uh, we started Gerhardt Law with the hope that we could help people escape from that environment if that was their desire. And I'm proud to say now that we have over 2,000 clients of, or that we've served over the last 15 years. So that's when you and, went out on your own 15 years ago? Yeah. And, um, and uh, you know, most of it has just been getting the word out or referrals, uh, some advertising. Yeah. Well, you guys are uh, good marketers though. You're, you know, you're out there well, you're, doing you're, stuff. You're, you're, thank my wife for that. So. Um, okay. Well, uh, whatever. You're, you're lucky <laughs> to have your wife, but I think a lot of us as lawyers, we gain no business skills. Nobody trains us how to do marketing and business development. You know, IP attorneys, I guess, put billboards up on the highway, but we really don't have any form. It doesn't count for continuing legal education. It should. Well, that's true. It should. it should. There should be business courses that you can take where most attorneys are, have small practices. You need to learn how to run your practice, grow your practice and market and all the things that you, and, and, you know, even from a social media standpoint, how do you, how do you, you know, work through the ethic rules in terms of all of that stuff and run your business. And it just doesn't seem like we get a lot of that kind of yeah. stuff. Well, I mean, there's a, a there's a lot of attorneys in the legal profession who want to be traditional attorneys and they want to do things the old way. And in some ways, it's not so bad that the legal system, you know, judges aren't texting and, you know, right. on Facebook and all this other stuff. Right. Because it, obviously that creates issues. Right. Yeah. They're, they're very, they're very conservative. The profession, maybe not politically, but in terms of its mindset is slow to change. And that's good because society needs parts of the society that are, are slow to change. And the legal system is sort of like the backbone, right? Right. The rest of the body can move around, but the, that's the framework that kind of keeps it all together. So, um, so there's a lot of people who don't want to market. And right. um, I've, I've talked with other uh, the, the best information is always talking to somebody else's legal assistant right. and they'll tell you, I put this spreadsheet in front of my boss. He doesn't want anything to do with knowing what the numbers are. He just wants to practice law. He doesn't care. Right, but isn't that what, crazy? If it's your own practice, you need to know your numbers. 
Yeah, well, that's I. You know, I agree with you. I think you're right. We all suffer from uh, what is it? Entrepreneurial poverty as lawyers. We none of us are going to retire. We're going to work till we're 92. There's a guy. He's a very nice guy. He's in my office here. He had downsized whatever because it's a co-working space. He's 86 years old, and he's still working. And I don't think he's going to retire. Yeah. Of course, he has nine that, kids. That'll he told be me. me. But yeah, right. It'll probably be me too. My uncle's in Marstown. He's in his 60s. He doesn't plan on retiring any soon. I mean, I, at, at this, I don't know if we're ever going to retire. We'll work less, maybe balance your yeah. quality of life. You know, it's not like the old days where you just like walk over the sunset 65, you die when you're 72. That's not going to happen. So, yeah, you know, it's a little bit different. But that's my struggles with the business is that we don't get a lot of business training. And you're right. There are people that don't want to do it. But I think some of it is like they don't want to do it because they're afraid of it. Or I mean, I don't think that they're, they have too much business to deal with. I find, I don't find any of those people, you know, that they have so much well, business that they don't need to market. No, I think you always need to market. You always got to, you know, I, I mean, if you want to keep the work coming in. Right. You guys you, have a huge yeah, clientele and, and a big business. Would you ever think of stopping marketing? Well, of course your wife would kick you in the head, but you know what I mean? It doesn't even occur to you. It's not in your fiber. No, it, it, it really doesn't. And even if you're a large firm with institutional clients, you've got to be out there talking to them, creating seminars for their in-house counsel right. that they want to go to, getting them tickets to the ball game for when yeah. their cousin comes into town. You don't want to lose that piece of business. Yeah. So even if you're not, you know, signing new engagement letters every week, um, you still have to market to your current clients to keep them, yeah. you know, engaged. You know, we know firms connected. have gone under, right? They lose one big major client. And they got to let 70% of their attorneys go. Yeah. It's a dangerous way to live, but whatever. Yeah. Well, that's, we, we've, we've decided, you know, we've decided that um, the night, one of the, there's, there's two sides to that coin, right? If you work with a lot of entrepreneurs, you have a lot of um, smaller clients, which is, delightful. That's what we want. But there's also a lot of administration that goes with that. Yeah. And you do have to spend more, I think, marketing time, right? You know, instead of just meeting with one client a week, I'm going, I'm meeting with a lot of clients. A right. Week, right. And a lot of potential clients. Plus some week. go out of business, you got to replace them things. Yeah. And so and if they have if they're smaller, they may have one or two projects. So you have to constantly have new business coming in. Right. Um, but if that model works, then you can, uh, then you can sustain yourself uh, if, uh, if a client leaves. Right. Uh, Not as know, big of so a hit. I'm, yeah. And on the other hand, what you said is just completely right a few minutes ago. If you're a one, one trick pony, one, one client or a couple big clients and one of them goes, which many eventually do, right then then you're r screwing around trying to figure out how to pay your bills yeah right? there was a firm in morristown i forget the firm i think they did a lot of education law and maybe their big client was like the city of elizabeth or something and there was a political change they lost the business and i know a lot of friends got laid off yeah that's too that's bad that way to live yeah yeah so let's talk about um I mean, you and I could talk about marketing stuff like all day long, but um, you know, about intellectual property, because I think one of the problems that I run into with a lot of small business owners that I work with, because I'm the general counsel, I'm not the specific counsel, I guess, is that people don't understand the rules, um, protect their intellectual property. Um, I could give you some examples as we talk about, it. I have a case right now that I'm wondering what happens with their intellectual property mm. and, you know, Patents being the secondary issue, but you know, really protecting the work and that they create. Right. Yeah. Well, there's lots of tools to do that, and um, a lot of it it depends on where you are in the entrepreneurial journey. Do you have a budget? Do you have sales? Are you bootstrapping? Do you have investment? Uh, what is your product? What is your market? What is your exit strategy? All of those things factor into coming up with an IP strategy that makes sense for you. And that's why it's always a good idea to, no matter what kind of business you're involved with or planning to be involved with, uh, you at least make a phone call to an IP professional. And you know, usually the first call is complimentary. 
Okay. And uh, certainly our, our calls, first calls are complimentary. And just talk to them about what your plans are. Uh, you don't have to give away any big secrets. I mean, even though you're protected by the attorney client privilege, um, you know, you may not feel comfortable just because you don't know the person that you're talking to. Right. You can talk in generalities and they'll be able to give you some ideas and steer you into some direction. So, uh, but the first step is really just to talk with a professional, uh, spend a little time online, uh, educating yourself is also a, a way to do it. Uh, but reading articles is not going to help you come up with a strategy. Right. And the, the value of having a professional, as you well know, is that we've seen thousands of different fact patterns over the years. We've worked with the patent office thousands, if not tens of thousands of times. We've worked with the trademark office thousands of times. The Library of Commerce and the Copyright Office, we've worked with them. We've been in the courts and we've seen lots of projects and we know what is practical and would probably work and we know what is impractical and would be a waste of time and money. So you get a lot of, it's, it's not just knowing the rules, it's knowing right. how the system works. And so if you, if you manage to connect with an experienced attorney, they'll be able to ask the right questions and get the right information for you. And um, so, yeah. so I would say the first, you know, the, the, there's four types of intellectual property that you need to know about, okay. right? So patents, they protect inventions and technology, okay. right? Tangible things, software too, but okay. So things. software can be patented. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I, I, that's like twenty percent of our practice is uh, software. Oh, I thought like the code gets copywritten. I don't know. Yeah. Well, you can do that. Right. But you got to do it the right way. Right. You, know, you don't. You don't put your whole code into the copyright office. What you do is because then people will see it, right? Right. <laughs> and so, <laughs> whoops, yeah, don't do that. Right, you put the first 50 lines in, and the it's last like copywriting the Coca Cola formula, right? <laughs> it's right there. <laughs> okay, I don't think they've copyrighted the Coca no, they formula. didn't because they don't want it to be public, right? No, that's the trade secret, and right. um, but yeah, so again, don't try this at home, folks, um, right? Yeah, you know, uh -huh. and and Filing a copyright with all your code, if you ever did want to patent it, triggers the one-year uh, statutory bar on filing a patent application. Oh, yeah, there you go. About See? That later. But yeah. Okay. If, well, if file make a, a patent, note if you're listening. You, 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 if you're <laughs> going to file a patent, you have to file it in time before, before public disclosures. And you have one year after the first public disclosure to file your patent. So filing your code at the copyright office is a public disclosure. When, so, when you say you have a year, you mean you have to do it within the year or you have to wait a year? Within the year. Okay. So you've, yeah. you've triggered that statute basically. Right. Okay. Now, um, so the other thing though you can do if you want to talk about your project and you don't want to trigger that bar is to get a confidentiality agreement. Right. Get an, an NDA. NDA. Right. Yeah. And you can go on the internet and get those. Um, some NDA is better, even if it's not a perfect one, is better than no NDA. Right. But sometimes there's times that you want to customize it, in which case you would go to Mitch or myself. And if you have multiple entities that you have to cover, you want to limit it to certain types of things, um, then you need a professional to talk it through with you. But if it's you're meeting with your designer, um, and it's pretty simple. You, I would, I would still always recommend getting an attorney involved. But if, if you, if you want to save a few bucks, then you can, you, you can do that. And but don't be penny wise and pound foolish. I mean, a lot of there's always issues with foolish. designers, yeah. right? They're designing a logo for you, whatever you pay them, and then they're claiming that it's their artwork. Well, you better have an agreement that says yeah, who owns better, it, right? Absolutely. I'm, yeah. I'm 100%, 100%. Yeah. And um, so anyway, the patents protect technology and trademarks protect brands. Okay. okay? So Coca-Cola is the most famous brand in the world and they have gazillions of trademarks on all the different ways they've used it. And it's a famous mark. And 
but the trademarks, uh, registered trademarks, you can register them in the US and you can register them internationally if you decide to work overseas, but that protects your brand. Okay. And then copyrights protect works of expression, which are songs, mus um, music and songs, <laughs> books, TV shows, right. books, novels. Uh, copyright arises as soon as you create the work. Right, it doesn't have to be registered have to register. in the Library of Congress for it to be a copyright. You right. wrote it. You, you just get it automatically. Okay. And there are advantages to registering a copyright, okay. but you don't have to. Okay. You still get some protection just by virtue of- So there's certain statutory protection that you get if you register? Well, you get a couple of things. One is that you get statutory damages Okay. And by, what that means is that if you sue an infringer, the court- Somebody who stole your material, right? Somebody who stole your material. Right, a okay. Thief, yeah. Uh, and if you, if you take the thief to court, the judge can order a set amount of damages each time your work was improperly used. You don't even have to prove damages. You don't have to prove damages which is a big, big advantage in litigation. Um, and as, as Mitch, I'm sure knows that proving damages in a copyright case, it can, can be really hard. Right. Um, and so in this case, the law says you automatically get this money for each violation of the copyright. And so a registration is only, I don't know, it's like 45, $75. Um, and so if you have it registered and a problem does come up, then uh, you, you have that. Another, and you need and, a copyright registration to bring suit. And I so. was gonna ask you a question. I'd heard, I don't know if this is true. You could, you could copyright like a collection of work. So if you were doing artwork for a book, you could copyright all the artwork in a, in a collection or no? Yeah, they're getting a little, it's kind of funny. Their copyright office lately has been going in two different directions. They're making it harder to put works together. Traditional, traditional they want the works. fees probably. Yeah. <laughs> and on the other hand, uh, social media users um, right. who want to register uh, blog posts or into Instagram or Facebook posts can register up to 50 for one fee. Oh. So it's sort of like on the one hand, they're taking the professionals and making right. them pay more money right. by making it harder. All the do-it-yourselfers, they give them an advantage. Yeah, but all the bloggers and everybody else, you can't do it with podcasts. Sorry, Mitch. Okay. But um, so there are some restrictions, but that was a new law that came out in August. And, right. But uh, you could, I don't know why you would do this, but you could copyright the the podcast content. I don't know why you would do that, but you just trademark the name of the podcast. I have a trademark pending for the podcast, but yeah, I mean, you could, the question is like, why um, is, is somebody going to use it in a way that would cause you economic injury? Yeah, so probably and, not. Yeah. Yeah, probably not. I mean, yeah. in most, most cases you want it to be out there. Yeah. You want yeah. people to be sharing your podcast, right? Cause that helps you. Right. But exactly. if you were to the point where this turned out to be a huge money maker instead of just a small money maker, right. but a huge money maker, right? Then it makes more sense now. If people are taking clips and they're claiming that they're Mitch, then um, you, that's problematic. You, know, you would want to stop. That'd blow up my deal right? with Spotify for fifty million dollars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. So, and then, so then you said there were four things though, right? Right. So we did, well, we did copyrights. We did trademarks. That was the Coca-Cola stuff. We did right. the patents. Right. And finally is trade secrets, right? Okay. And so trade secrets are <clears throat> a pretty mm -hmm. kind of misunderstood, but they're still valuable IP tools. It's basically a trade secret is uh, anything that's secret that gives you a commercial advantage. So Makes sense. Lot, lots of times like recipes, you would, you might like want we to. We were keep saying the Coca-Cola formula, right? Right. That was trade a trade secret. secret. Exactly. Perfect. Yeah. And, because you'd be an uh, idiot to copyright that because everybody would <laughs> know what the formula says. Right. But you didn't give that advice. No. No. You said and obviously that was, they didn't get that advice. That was that a bad either. idea. That was, right. That was, that would be a, that would, uh, that would not be a. Little a malpractice super, issues. Super yeah. smart move. Right. But we know that you. Would never 
do that. So, but do you have some sort of protection because they're trade secrets or do you have to have an agreement in place? No, it just arises automatically. But what you have to do is you have to prove that it was a secret and that you intended to keep it secret. So you have to have ah, okay. internal processes. The hardest right. part about a trade secret case is proving that it was actually kept secret. So if you have something that you want to claim as a trade secret, right. then you have to take affirmative steps to make it secret. You have to, in the olden days, you'd write, trade secret on the folder and then put it in a locked cabinet and write trade secret on the cabinet and you take pictures of it and say, see, this is a trade secret. <laughs> and um, nowadays it's all about security and data and limiting it to need to know basis, but they can be very valuable. Dow Corning Corporation uh, had their basic process as a trade secret. And that was the process that they use to make the materials that they sell. Yeah, Corningware was a thing, right? Yeah, I mean, that was, uh, that was Corning. And so they, they, they kept the manufacturing part of that a secret. So none of their competitors Should would steal. know how, what they were doing. And, right. um, and then if you have a trade secret and somebody leaves, an employee leaves, and they take their secret, they take your secret and they tell somebody else then you can take steps to stop that. So it applies not just to manufacturing, but like customer lists. If you have a, right. a, a client list or a customer list. Right. Um, that well, do you are, have to have though something in writing with the employee? So if you had a trade secret, you can't claim this to be a trade secret, but you didn't have an agreement with the employee, non-compete, non-disclosure, non-client stealing, non-circumvent. If you didn't have any of those agreements in place, is there statutory protection anyway? Yeah, I mean, as long as it's, as long as you intend to keep it, you know, secret, you, then you, that, right? you, you get the trade secret. But all of the things you mentioned are best practices. And having, right, it's obviously easier if you had an agreement that says, yeah, oh, Richard know, signed this, it shows that it's a trade secret. Right, yeah, he, this person signed this and said they weren't going to steal any of our stuff, but they did. Right. Yeah, you know, that that makes your case easier. Um, so um, I think people don't think a lot about clients. Um, I even have small businesses like hair salons where they have their, their stylists sign non-competes and non, what, and not non-client, you know, no client stealing agreements because they know that, I mean, listen, if you want to open 20 miles away, fine, but don't walk down the street, start a salon and take all of your customers with you. It's going to cause right. damage and they have them sign. Those types of things. Yeah. And, you know, in terms of enforceability and everything, I mean, you know, I'm sure, you know, there's, there's limits to how far you can go with those. Yeah. These people do like five miles in a year. So you can still get a job. You know? right. <laughs> it's enough to keep you from working down the street, but yeah. But I think people don't think about that till it's too late. And it's not, you and I both know it's hard to have a, a, an employee sign those kind of agreements after they're employed because it lacks a lot of consideration. Just that they're gonna fire you is not enough consideration. So you gotta give them a bonus or something. You should have had them sign it when they started working, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you wanna make sure that you have, uh, you know, as part of the package that you send over to that new employee, you have that employment agreement. Right. And uh, you have it set up right. And, a lot of small know, business that. owners skip that step. They don't think about it. It's unfortunate. Yeah. Well, so your big companies. If you get burned practice. once, then you think about that's it. That's what does it. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly what does it. They get burned. Why do you think the salon I have does that? Because they got burned one time. I didn't do it for them. I met them and I do work for them now, you know. So now, what about. Yeah, well, I pay them for it, but yeah. And they give um, you a discount. They, well, they sometimes we trade services if they need work and I need haircuts. <laughs> but um, what about service marks? How does that differ from trademarks? It's really not legally, uh, I mean, that's a good Same question. Thing. People ask me that all the time. There's really legally no difference except service marks protect services, trademarks protect products. The case oh. law. It's not like a, I thought a service mark was like a tagline and a trademark was the name of the company. Obviously no. not, I'm completely no. wrong. Uh, uh, in, in trademark world, we call a tagline a tagline. Okay. So, um, so yeah, you and you can trademark those too, um, depending on the trade, uh, depending on the words. So if you want to 
trademark something, um, you have to make sure that it's not uh, descriptive. So if I had wanted to open a law firm called Richard's Law Firm, right? I happen to be Richard. Right. I couldn't get a trademark on Richard's no, Law Firm. No, because another Richard can open Richard's Law Firm if he's a lawyer, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. And um, I've also seen something where you get a trademark, but they want you to disclaim the use of a generic word. Like, it, you know what I mean? Like if it's called the Beinhacker Law Firm, they might give you a trademark for the Beinhacker Law Firm, but you got to disclaim the use of the word law that it's not specific to you. I've seen right. those from, right? <laughs> Yeah, all, all the time, they people ask for disclaimers, and, and I, the trademark examiner does. And right. it's fine. Right? Normally, just you go ahead and do it. I mean, right. it's usually just the common words in the mark, and it's not the meaty part of the mark, so it doesn't really make a difference when you're trying to enforce it. Right, like the accidental entrepreneur. I'm not going to get a trademark on accidental and entrepreneur. They're just general common words, but together means something. Right, You know. right. And especially, and, and you have to remember the goods play a big role in, or the services, if you're getting a service mark, they all play a big role in uh, whether a trademark is descriptive. So if you said Richard's Law Firm for Donuts, you could probably get a trademark called Richard's Law Firm for Donuts because it's not for legal Specific, services. right. And so there's a famous case, the Lexus, Lexus case where uh, Lexus is a legal the, the car software company? And versus Lexus, the car company. Uh, yeah, because Lexus is, the, you're talking about LexisNexis, the law firm, the legal, yeah, right. So yeah. that's L-E-X-I-S, right? Right. Okay. And Lexus is with a U-S, right. right? But in the world of trademarks, those those tiny little differences don't. No, because it's the issue matter. of potential confusion, right? Isn't that right. one of the factors? Okay. I know a little yeah. bit about this stuff. See? Yeah, you do. You know a lot, actually. <laughs> it rubs off when I spend time with you. So. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the test is sight, sound, and meaning. Uh, are the marks the same? You know, do they have the same? They look the same, sound the same, right. and mean the same. Uh, I'm not sure what Lexus means. Probably something Probably some in Japanese word Latin. or something, right? I don't know. But, um, oh, Lexus could be law, right? Um, yeah. 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 Uh, but... Anyway, um, you, two people can have the same trademark or essentially the same trademark for the same goods, right? So, or for different goods. Oop, for different goods, different that category, for, right? For different categories. So you can have right. Lexus for cars. You can also have it for legal software. Okay. And, um, and that's and what so, happened in that case. And, they, yeah, and the court upheld that it's okay to have the same name in two different categories. So I could have Richard's Donuts or a Richard's Law Firm for Donuts, or I could have Richard's Donuts for a law firm name if they let me do that in New Jersey. I don't think they would. But it would be a great way to attract no, but business. you know, they did just recently rule, though, that we now can have non-attorney names for law firms. Trade names. About law firms. two weeks ago, the Supreme oh. Court came down, just like CPA firms. So I think you're going to see trademarking being done in our profession as time goes on. We, we, you wow. know, we could be the ace law firm and ace is not the name of one of the partners <laughs> yeah well it used to be that well when i first started i wanted to open uh gearheart law and i wanted uh, but i didn't want to call it gearheart law i wanted to call it patents express yeah that now you'll and, be able to do and, that and i could uh, and but then when you look at the word patents express it looked like patents sex press oh yeah that's and good. i just thought that that would not work <laughs> so you so, didn't try that. so we dropped that completely that's funny well that's and what then, you're going to see going forward it's going to be different yeah and it used to be had to be one of our names right or a dead partner right right and so so if you really like somebody you go out and kill them and then yeah the there you go well I, I knew a guy who was in the marketing space he had a advertising company and it was called uh bogart delafield ferrier and he did that to, well, he liked Humphrey Bogart. I don't know where Delafield came from. He was the only guy, but he named the, he named the practice uh, or the business because he wasn't a lawyer. He didn't have those issues, um, you know, from a marketing, he was using it from a marketing standpoint. So we're going to see some interesting things in our space, I think. Well, 
I, for me, we, we do actually have trademarks on Gerhardt Law and we yeah, have- Yeah, sure you do. And, your uh, name our, though our fits really well, well in your space. Yeah. Gear, yeah. you know, it's like Gear machinery and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. You know, technology with a heart. That's right. Kind of there you our, go. I'm sure thing, Elizabeth has a know. field day with that. Yeah. So, so let's talk about what makes a, a mark, uh, you know, strong, because I know that just because you and I file a trademark on our name and we haven't even started in business doesn't mean that we have a lot of protection, right? It's got to use it. Right. So that's a big part. And if you're a starting entrepreneur, and the branding piece is super important to you, you can actually file a trademark before you start using it in commerce. Right. And it's called an intent to use application. Okay. And it's the same cost as a regular uh, trademark application. Which is what, 225, 250? Yeah, 275. Something like that, yeah. Something like that. Um, and that then, does not include the legal fees to pay your lawyer to do it. It's no, just the application no, no. Fee. That's, that, the fee is usually the smaller part, but, right. um, yeah. um, but in any case, uh, yeah, you can, you can file it on intent to use basis and you can sort of put yourself in line. Um, but tr at the end of the day, trademark law is all about who used the mark first in commerce. Okay. And so it's not who files first. Filing first gives you some advantages, but they're, you know, it, it basically prevents other people who are filing intent to use marks from getting your mark first. So you if you file the use, intent to use, and right. then I started using the mark and not knowing you or knowing what the mark is, I would not be barred from using it? Um, that's a complicated legal question. Okay. So, um, but it is, you should, you know, it, it does definitely mark your place uh, in line. And then okay. you want to use the mark as quickly as you can. And is there a and limit, like at a point where the application dies, if you don't use it by a certain date? You get three years. Oh, and that's a long you time. you renew it every six months. And so there's oh. a fee for that. And you're paying, you know, if you're using a, a firm, um, you know, you're paying for that. Too. I can't, well, what are you going to do? Yeah, it's been three years. You haven't used the mark yet. What? Use it. Yeah, it's time to kind of, you can always reapply, you know, right, okay. if, you know, if somebody else hasn't taken it. But. Now, let's say I started using a mark um, and two years from now, I file a trademark on the mark. Maybe I put a TM, right? That's a common law trademark by my name. Do I, does my application go retroactive to my date of use, my first date of use? Absolutely. And oh, so okay. you know, doing a trademark is not necessarily one of the first things you have to do, but you do have to do a trademark search early in the process because many times we'll have clients who come to us and they've been using a mark for a couple of years. Right. And somebody- With no registration. With no registration. Meaning they have no registration. They've no, just been using yeah, it. Yeah, so no okay. registration. And somebody with a registration in California sees their website and says, wait a minute, I've got a trademark on that. Stop. And you've spent a lot of time and energy uh, investing in your brand. Right. And now you either have to duke it out and lit court or you have to pay a license fee or you have to change your branding. So getting a trademark search done by a competent professional is really, really important when you're starting your business. Even if you, you know, if you work with your heart law, we charge $2,500 for the whole process. Oh, to, to so it's, search. Not, it's, it's not like, it depends on what your budget is, right? but it's not hundreds of thousands of dollars. Right. Right. And, and so the search part of that is, is, is $700. Right. So, at least do the search part and make sure that you're picking a name that is not going to be uh, problematic. And I can go on and on and on with stories about people who filed their own trademarks. They didn't do a trademark search. They maybe even got their own trademark. And then they find out later, a trademark can be challenged after it's issued. Just be, you know, and so if you don't do the search and there's somebody else out there before you and the examiner doesn't pick up on it. Oh, that happens. You mean like, office. like they have a trademark in the database, you file an application and it still gets approved. Oh yeah. I have that okay. issue right now with a, a client. 
Uh, we're fighting an opposition, which is a litigation proceeding at the trademark office. He filed for his name a couple of years after. Um, we warned him about this other company, but it was a very small company at the time. And he decided to assume the risk and move forward with his name because he was infatuated with it. And five years later, the company got $100 million in funding and went public. And now they're chasing him because um, the names are too similar. Right. And uh, fortunately, we've been able to negotiate a pretty good uh, agreement with the opposing side, but you know that was a you know if 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 you know he he should have really he, he filed he filed on his own first and then he came to us and we said well hmm. and uh, you know so getting that and that's like hundreds of thousands of dollars later in litigation. Oh really? It, well, I don't know. Yeah, you know, uh, it was a lot more thousands. than just the search. Yeah. That's for sure. And, you know, but it's going to cost him hundreds of thousands of dollars. He has to change part of his name, not all of his name. That right. was the victory. He gets to keep the first part, which is the strong part, but he has okay. to change the back part, which is, uh, and he's, he has to go through a whole rebranding process. So it is yeah. going to cost him hundreds of thousands of dollars to fix the problem. And so, uh, you know, I can tell you another interest, interesting story. So this person who wasn't a client, he became client um, later, right. he had purchased a furniture store. Okay. And the attorney who did the due diligence on the, uh, the furniture store purpose didn't check the trademark register. So if you're buying <laughs> or selling a business, you got to check the trademarks to the make buyers. sure. buyers, yeah, you should. The, yeah. So... This, this guy he bought the furniture store from it had been in business for 25 years. The owner was old school, never had a website. So as soon as he bought the business, he put his website up. And there was a guy in Maryland who had a trademark, same name, same type of company. He was 100% dead. And he bought that, spent $5 million for that business and eventually had to change the name because, and, you know, of course, all the goodwill of 25 years of, of selling in the Goes community out the window. is out the window, right? So it's important to make sure that you get that stuff done. And I, I'm glad I wasn't the attorney who did the deal for him because, right. you know, that, that, could, that, that's, that could be really painful to, to hear that from a client, you know, so... Now, you'll, uh -huh. I guess you also want, normally in those purchase agreements, we put representations from the seller that they have the right to a name, that they you can do your own searches, but also, but then, you know, you, what do you do? You go back and sue the seller, it's going to cost you more money, more time and aggravation. Yeah. You know, avoid it. Um, I want to ask you this, though. What, tell me a little bit of a sales pitch for you, but why just like going out and, I mean, you can go to the USPTO dot org website right you can do a basic search of the trademarks and you could do a google search why is that not necessarily sufficient because obviously for 700 bucks they're not doing a google search no we have a, a special subscription database that compiles trademarks in a particular way okay uh, and we do a federal search if the client wants to spend additional money we can do sort of a scorched earth type of search where we not only check the federal trademark register, but we check state mark uh, trademark registers. We check URLs. We check business names. We really like just check much everything. more comprehensive. Yeah, much more comprehensive. For most entrepreneurs, a federal trademark search is uh, is enough. Um, but for if the brand is really important, then we'll we'll do the scorched earth uh, search. Um, so what's the difference? Well, the main difference is just our, we have seen so many trademarks and we know how the trademark office interprets these things. You may not know whether a mark is suggestive or descriptive. Suggestive is okay. Descriptive is not. We have done enough work with the trademark office that we know whether that mark is going to be considered suggestive or descriptive. Not 100%, right. but we, we have pretty good instincts because that's all we do. Right. And um, is it gonna be confusingly similar to another mark? 
That's another thing they reject them for. Right. And, you know, we can, because we know what happens if the process goes wrong, we can discourage a very enthusiastic entrepreneur from making a stupid mistake. And, um, and so those things are uh, important. And then after the market's filed, we have databases that track uh, everything that's going on. We report to you regularly about with correspondence when something comes in. We remind you that this decision is due at a certain point. Will you please give us an answer? Do you want to do this? Do you want to do that? And so we stay on top of it for you. So you don't have to worry about it. Right. You file a trademark yourself, you get a paper, you have six months to, to uh, answer it. And then, you know, we get many clients who filed themselves, they get an office action response, it goes abandoned because you only get one notice from the trademark office, right? And it, and they forget about it. It's six months away, right? right? And, uh, but we don't, we have a reminder system set up so that we're nagging you to get, um, make a decision, whether it's a go forward or drop it, whatever it is, we, we nag you until you make up your mind. And, um, and so, you know, that's part of the service a, as well. And we also have watch services. So if you have a trademark and you want to be able to monitor what other trademarks are being issued or out on the market, then we can take steps to advise you. Sometimes we can intervene and prevent the other trademark from being issued. So there's a lot of advantages that, uh, you know, that, you know, we know how to get around the rejections. We, that we know how to, we know when to disclaim it. We know when to fight it. We know how to write the description of goods so it, it covers what you have now and what will work in the future. Right. And so all of those things are, if you want strong tra trademark protection, um, you know, that's, that's what you need. If that's, if you don't care about those things, I go to legal zoom. I mean, I send people out oh, too much money. Well, right. Okay, what no else problem. are you going to tell them? Go, I know I do go, the same thing zoom sometimes and, or, or do it yourself. Call I the trademark office than that, right? and they'll help you out. You right. know, um, if you don't think that that kind of advice is worth the money, then I'm fine with that. Right. Um, and, yeah. uh, I'm not going to try to push you into something that you don't, no. don't want. I, I think so, people don't realize how much though uh, intellectual property touches their life. You get a lot of people where they'll set up a website and they'll pull photos offline that they think are free or they have a designer do it. And then they get a letter from Getty images that tells them they're infringing and they take it down and we want a fee for $5,000. Like what? I didn't pay $5,000 for the whole website. You know, <laughs> you get a lot of that, right? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I, those fees can usually be, ne be negotiated. Down, yeah, right. Of course, sure you know. I've negotiated a lot of them away. Why go there in the first place? Right. Well, you, you know, you want your designer. Look, that's when it comes down to contracts. You want a contract with your designer that says that anything that they're using, they have the right to use and make sure that they do. Because sometimes you can't check yourself, you know, they put right. up photographs on it. or go to one of these services, uh, Shutterstock or iPhoto and purchase the photos. Right. But read the fine print. Some of those purchases are right. Aren't some of those, the right to use licenses are a little off. You think you're buying this thing you put up anywhere and you find that it's a limited license for print only or something like that. Right. You got to read the fine print. That's usually why you use a lawyer. Right. And if you're using professional photographers and they all have different philosophies and approaches, you know, okay, uh, this headshot that I did for you can only be used on your website. If right. you want to put it in a brochure, you have to pay extra. Right. Right. And read what you, you sign. Yeah. So make sure you know, uh, you know, what the charges are and unless you just have lots of money and don't care. Right. <laughs> well, I don't know anybody. I don't know anybody has lots of money. and doesn't care. I know people have a lot of money. Usually the people that have the money are the ones that care. Let, right. let me ask you this question. Cause I've run into this um, recently where I have a small business and they have a name, you know, it's not Coca-Cola, but they have a name to the business. Maybe they filed a, you know, a, a certificate with the county. They didn't even file a trademark, but it's in use and they're breaking up, right? They're, they're liquidating the business and maybe arguing about it. They have a website, they have a name, they have social media accounts. 
what happens with that property? Where, where does it go? You can't split it up. It's not like a bank account where you could split a dollar into 50 cents and 50 cents. Yeah, I mean, um, so that's a common law trademark. Most businesses, whether they know it or not, have common law trademark rights because right. trademarks accrue by use. And common law trademarks uh, uh, extend to any place where you've done business. So if you've done business in three states, you're, you would get you know, common law trademark rights in three states. Right. Usually it's more local. Okay. Um, but it's a uh, asset like any other asset of the company. The owners right. could agree to, you know, let each other use the name. Right. If they were going to go after different markets or if they were going to work in different geographic areas. Uh, or they could decide that the goodwill is going to be owned by one of them. Um, and it's just like any other asset that's negotiated. And now, now, what happens if I have one right now as a bakery and I don't think they're going to agree. Now, one of the guys I think owns, he bought, so I don't know if there was a county, there was definitely nothing filed with the state. It was a DBA. So let's say it was called, you know, the, the bake shop and they started using the croissant shop as their DBA as an alternate name. It wasn't filed right. with the state apparently. Right. And they didn't have a trademark in this case. So they're fighting over what to use. So the one guy went out, I think, and formed an LLC called the Croissant Shop in New Jersey because it was available. It wasn't filed anywhere. So can the other person block him or her from using that name? They're dissolving the business. The business is going to dissolve. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, that's a, that's a, it. That's, I, you know, I, I don't know the answer to that. Very facts question, and circumstance. But, yeah. but it's just, it's an asset. So it's like the, it's like the croissant machine. Who gets it? Right. You know? And, you know, if, if somebody goes in there and steals it at night and walks off with it and puts it in their bake shop. Gotta assume. Then there's, there's laws around right. that, yeah. that, you know, it's a type of theft, right? right. And of course. so it's the same thing with intellectual property. If, uh, because yeah, I guess you could sell the name in theory and then split the money up, right? It's the same thing as selling a you could do that the, the, the machine, yeah. So it's just a, it's just an asset of the business, like any other asset. It's a little different because it's intangible, right? right. So it's not like the donut machine or the croissant machine where it's there and you know, put you know, who possesses it and it's on what property and. You know, usually you would do some sort of accounting and you would say, okay, um, well, I put in the money and I bought this machine, you know, right. so it's mine. Or, you know, I was the chief marketing person and I spent all my time marketing and I'm the one that built up the reputation and the goodwill of the shop. So I have a better claim to the trademark. And you would, you know, that's how you argue it, it or you you'd settle it in court, hopefully not. Right. But no, you'd, you'd, because you'd the name it itself probably doesn't have a lot of value on the street. But to you and to your partner, both of which have worked in this store and feeling like, well, I want to continue the store and not with you. It's valuable to the two of you, but nobody else. So it's got no intrinsic value. Well, that's not necessarily true. I mean, people buy goodwill uh, all the time. And, you know, companies buy other companies and part of what they're buying is the, the name, the, the name of the company, right. right? They may completely change everything. So um, I only say that because it, you, you know, as, as business owners, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want them to think, well, um, our name is not worth anything. It, right. it may not be worth anything, but it could to be other people, lot. right? It yeah. might still be worth something to you. And it be. brings up an interesting point because when it comes to like, buy sell agreements and what do you do if you want to leave the business? I, I find or I found over the years, a lot of them don't address intellectual property specifically, no. and it probably should. Social yeah. media accounts, websites, telephones, names, something I'm going to address going forward when I do them for people. Yeah. You can't split those up. No. Yeah. No, breaking up is hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> Well, speaking of that, I, I appreciate all your time spending with me and the valuable information you've given to people. We'll put your contact information in the show notes. You had mentioned that you know you're available for a short free consult if somebody has an issue they want to run by you. Yep. 
basically what happens is people call and I talk on and on and on and I, yeah, I them, do too. You know, just I talk, talk to talk to them about what they need. And then usually, you know, we say it's a half hour, but yeah, I do too, but it always goes more than that. And sometimes it's a little more, sometimes a little less. So, right. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, Richard, say hello to Elizabeth and I appreciate you coming on the, the show, sharing, sharing your knowledge.